Today we're talking about liturgical abuse. We're going to talk about what is liturgy and some of the greatest abuses that are still at this time in our masses. Here with me, co-host Timothy Gordon. Timothy, how are you? Excellent in 2019. Yes. Uh, well, this uh, this episode, I'm just going to be uh, passing the mic to you because I go to the Latin Mass, so I do not experience any liturgical abuse. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's not no actually fair. true. I, I do occasionally find myself at the Novus Ordo, including um, this year at a kid's Christmas Mass. Ooh. It's rough. And uh, I saw a woman take the host in her hand and hide it and walk down the aisle. Really? And you I watched her, and then I went to the lay Eucharistic minister and said, there's a woman who just received communion and didn't concede. And he goes, get her. Like, follow <laughs> that really? car, yeah. So I chased her down, and I found her in her seat, and I kind of, the corner of my eye, I was going to like walk across the people to just be nice to her and explain what the situation was but then i saw her what i thought put in her mouth and she was chewing and i was like okay well nothing i can do now that was gum bro that was gum it's not good man communion the hands bad yeah. we're gonna talk all about that aren't we i know you don't of like course. it yeah of course bad of course. deal um look these things are i mean most of, i think most of the items that make my list are 90 to 95 percent of the novus ordos in town i feel like i'm being conservative you know i, I think they're i think I think a less, a less cautious man, a less circumspect man might even assert these are happening at 98% of the masses in town. But most of the items, the line items to make this list, when we get to it in a little bit, are 90% or better. Uh, yeah. Only a couple are maybe particular to certain um, dinosaur priests, but, but uh, you know, that are true believers in the new religion of Novus Ordo Catholicism, you know, not, not, not to critique, you know, we're staying away well, from that. Well, I mean, we want to say new religion. I mean, <laughs> Look, all the, all the is... Sede Vecantis out there just gave you standing ovation. No, 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 no. Yeah, to put your hand down, son. This isn't, this isn't your time. We're not talking about, you know, the popes are valid. It's yeah. still technically, technically speaking, uh, the same magisterial faith, but when you go to a Novus Ordo and there are all of the, on full display, you have all of the weaponized ambiguity in operation. In That's operatio. really it. That's really it. That's the weaponized ambiguity. Look, I've been saying this for 20 years. Before we get into, well, okay, what is liturgy? What's the point of the liturgy, which you're going to, I think, I think, you know, we'll, we'll hear from you on because that's really the heart of it. How do you, how do you identify an error before you identify the, the correct answer, the content? We'll do that. But think about, think about this. I've called this since I was a kid, you know, like I've said so many times on the show before, uh, sort of a high functioning agnostic atheist, just snickering through the mass. Um, which I, I really believe from the highest points, from the highest peaks of the intellectual left in the church was the point, right? To make smart, smart young people kind of just dismiss it. Um, it's weaponized ambiguity. And what I used to say until right around New Year's of this year, it's the first evidence I ever saw. You tweeted it, sir. You said it was a Skillebex quote. And it was, we know what we're doing. We know how we'll do it later. There's intentional vagueness. So I was like, I have no clue where you, Yeah. I tweeted you, you um, didn't write back, but no, uh, you, you know, I, I, I don't asked. know you on Twitter. Like, yeah, who's that do. guy? You do. Who's, who's this weirdo? Speaking of, if you guys, if you guys watch the show with Tim and I, and you just want to join the fun 24 seven, we're on Twitter having a ball. Quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a, quite a lot of fun. In fact, we need to put up some of these images these people are making memes of us, and they're getting quite creative. They are. They are. They're so, sometimes demeaning, always outrageous, <laughs> never not Some fun. of them are cool. Uh, like the uh, the Tombstone ones are cool. Those ones are good. Where good. you're Doc Holliday like and I'm Wyatt Earp. Yeah. I might get I like that, that like framed up here behind me. Me too. I got two guns, one for each of you. Right? Yeah. Like Doc says when uh, say he's, he's so drunk he's seeing double. I got two guns, one for each of me. And that's, that's how I feel about the Novus Ordo church. It's like, look, what, I mean, I, I can remember saying this in middle school, talking to one of my buddies, so it was sixth or seventh grade. And I was like, you know, my buddy was talking about Fatima. Actually, it's the first time I ever heard that they didn't read it. He's been talking about Fatima since he was four. 
six <laughs> <Right. laughs> four months old. Get it, get it straight. Like, no, it was it was sixth grade, and uh, it was sixth grade. And I was talking to my buddy Jason, and his mom knew a lot about it, and. We were talking about, you know, I don't think we were talking about like the mass, like what's liturgical abuse, but I was just saying I always found the mass ridiculous. Um, might have been a separate conversation. I was in Plano, Texas there. And what I said is, look, clearly, clearly, whether or not it was written to be this way or not, like it's the equivalent of a judge. If assuming that the Novus Ordo mass was written to be 100 percent faithful and all that. And it wasn't just an issue and execution, then it would be the equivalent of since 95 or better of all percent of the parishes out there are in direct contravenience of these norms, the faithful norms, as as kind of people in the middle will tell you, then it would be the equivalent of a judge hands down a verdict, not guilty. Right. Hands the hands the verdict to the bailiff, as they still do in, in some states. And the bailiff basically. Um proceeds as if it was a guilty verdict and starts taking the guy away in handcuffs. And everyone's just sitting there like, yep, this is normal. This is good. And you're the one sane person. You have no mouth. And yet you must scream like Harlan Ellison wrote 50 years ago. You're the one person. You're like, it was a not guilty verdict. Everyone's just proceeding as if it was guilty. And you're like the only guy. And then literally you you go home and whoever it is, your relative who was on trial is on death row and preparing to kill him. They're just going through everything. You're like, OK, this had to have been designed this way. That's that's what I have to say about right. all of the baby boomer foolishness that comprises all of these complaints today. Really, that, that makes it sound too lovable. Baby boomer foolishness is, um, you know, like like monkeys music or something that's that's baby boomer foolishness we can laugh at it it doesn't hurt anyone until you start singing those damn songs in church which they started doing then it it's, becomes toxic it's not fun i'm There's not no happy good. i'm not happy uh tim did you see the 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 little squirmish that came up in the twitter verse and online over at one peter five uh a friend of ours friend of mine father dwight longenecker wrote the piece 12 reasons why to like the novus ordo or 12 reasons why I like the Novus Ordo. Yes. And then over at 1 Peter 5, uh, and I, of course, love Father Long and I. He just built this gorgeous church, his liturgy, chant. I mean, everything the Novus Ordo should be, Father Longenecker does that. Right. So he's like, look, it's awesome. And then there was a counter argument put out by Peter. I'm probably going to butcher the name. I think it's Kwasniewski. Is that how you say it? Kwasniewski. Kwasniewski. Yeah. Kwasniewski. Yeah. And he put out a piece, 12 reasons not to prefer the Novus Ordo, and there's going back and forth, and of course, loud track. I didn't, I didn't read the original Longenecker piece. I okay. just saw the Kwasniewski kind yeah, of Yeah, they're both worth reading. Response. Yeah, they're worth yeah. reading. But you they're know, smart dudes. Exactly. I like both of them. Um, and I'm definitely all in on these debates, but what I was thinking, and I actually put one tweet up kind of like this, um, is that unless you have a guy like Father Longenecker who was, you know, trained liturgically as an Anglican like I was, as an Anglican priest, cleric, um, and you, you've imbibed good taste in century, a century-long tradition that was never really hijacked by like a, a 1960s all-inclusive council that touched every single, you know, the, the liturgy, the hierarchy, canon law, everything. So Anglicans didn't have that. So... You know, Father Longenecker is blessed. He comes from a liturgical tradition, and he brings all that beauty and that reverence. And so he's, right. you know, all about ad orientum and the tabernacle in the middle and altar rails and all of these things that are wonderful and great and part of our tradition as Catholics. But unfortunately, that's ext extremely rare. Like you just said, 95% of Novus Ordo churches are not that. Right. I would even say 97, 98% are not right. that maybe 99% are not that. And that's the problem is right. that you can make it good and you can make it bad. It depends on the local priest. In that's theory, the problem. In theory though, what I'm saying is there's like a meta email that went around in the late sixties. <laughs> you know, here's, here's sacrosanctum concilium. Here's the, the sacred right. constitution on roughly what the new mass should be. It, as Skilabix, uh, the 
kind of foreshadowed, right. intimated. Not was foreshadowed, in he a way stated it. He, stated, he said, we he put stated. ambiguity in the documents and we knew how we would interpret it later. Fair enough. I just mean, he, he was saying it. It sounded like that quote hailed from 1966 or 67 when they, the, the council had concluded and they hadn't yet produced the work product of the document. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, whatever. But yes, um, you're right. So he, he said, this is what we were doing. It's not just a, an intimation. But in terms of the work product that followed, it was called Sacrosanctum Concilium. It's one of the sacred constitutions oh, Vatican from II. Vatican II. And, but it, so it comes out, it's the first one, right? It comes out in like 62 before the council's done. They don't go to work on implementing it into writing the new missile, the, the missile of Paul VI, until after the whole council is done in the 60s, uh, in 65, between 65 and 69. When they're working on the new mass and they eventually write the the um, Novus Ordo mass, you get a work product that doesn't look anything like a faithful liturgy. And and always, I mean, take something like versus populum, you know, the the the, equi- the poise of the priest during consecration, right? Versus populum, he's always facing you. Is that just 95% of the time, 19 out of 20 masses? I've never been to a Novus Ordo when he's, he's facing where he really should be. I've, I've been to Orientum. under 10, probably somewhere around 7 or 8. I've been to Novus Ordo at Orientum. And trust me, I'm a kind of guy looking for it. Me, t- me too. It's like I just walked right. into a pair. Oh, look, at Orientum here. What a, I'm a lucky right. guy. I like look for that. Right. I, 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 okay, I, I've been to one, and it was an experiment when Cardinal Sarah said, hey, for Lent, was it Lent or, or Advent? Advent? It was Lent. Advent. You're making Advent. Up. Whatever it was. Advent of a purple 2017. Season. Yeah. It was, it was purpley, <laughs> as, uh, as Will Ferrell says in ALF. I like your very mug, pur- by the way. Very purpley. That mug's nice. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. You, you team, see, uh, team Vegano. I wonder, I wonder why you like that. That's yeah, great. Team Vegano. Is it the, the lime green people? It's good. Is I think the starkest, most beautiful contrast with that with that black and white vegan. Oh, it's gorgeous. Man. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's a gorgeous color. Yeah, that's so, the one I have. I got that one. I bought one for. I'm buying one for one of my students. I said, "What color do you want?" There are like 18 possibilities or something. Hmm. Whatever he said, I like the lime. Everyone yeah. likes lime. Lime. What was I saying though? Yeah. So uh, there's been one one that I've ever been to, and it was like very experimental. This is baby boomer foolishness. Uh, with teeth, you know, dangerous, toxic, mm-hmm. fatal, even baby boomer foolishness, uh, um, grown up and come home to roost. And so most of these things we'll eventually talk about, I think, are, are much more than 95 percent. First, before before any of this has a, a ground for this. Hold on, can I read the complaint. can I read the Schilbeck's quote? Do it. Yeah. I love it when I Google something and then I find myself stating it. In, on Twitter? Is. Yeah, yeah here this is. is you. And- here it is. So this is, uh, he says, quote, we have used ambiguous phrases during the council. I mean, Second Vatican Council. We have used ambiguous phrases during the council, and we know how we will interpret them afterwards, end quote. There he is. One of boom, your, one of your Nouvelle Théologie ninjas right there, Father Schilbeck. Yeah. And he's basically saying, we were weaving an ambiguity. It's weaponized right. ambiguity, like our which, Monsignor Pope. Which young Gordon literally called out in sixth or seventh grade. I wish I knew exactly the grade. I was literally like, this has to be what's going on. So, so I mean, did just, you know that it changed? You know that there, were, there had been a previous Latin mass and all that? You knew that? Yeah, because, I mean, it, okay. look, uh, you, you know, you, you were raised, you know, a, a Protestant in the faith. It was like something they would talk about in Catholic school and religion classes like, oh, did you know that, that, you know, before before the church was you know brought up to speed, that there is actually an old mass in a whole nother language kind of yeah. thing, you know, in, in the, the priest olden faced days, the other way. And the priest wasn't even facing towards you. I didn't know all the particulars, but. Um, so, you know, what's crazy about my when I was an Anglican priest, a cleric. At my parish. We only had ad orientum. The high really? altar was against the wall. You couldn't possibly have said versus populum in that church. Really? And everyone, yes, every single one that I ever said 
was at Orientum. The only exception was if I was like subbing in at another church, even then I probably would have done it at Orientum. And then once I would go m- once a month to the nursing home and they had it set up, guess by whom? Catholics, sure. Roman Catholics, who would set the whole thing up versus Populum. So I had to do it versus Populum because that's how the Catholics did it. Of course. But we did it at Orientum and we also had altar rails and you had to do it kneeling. There's no way you could receive, even though it's not a valid communion, you couldn't receive communion there unless you were kneeling at the altar rail. Wow. And then I became a Catholic and it's kumbaya and people standing up and lay people handing. Oh, we, you didn't have lay people handing out communion in the Episcopal. Yeah. Well, Priest. Wow. wow. Priest so did it's it. Like, that's like the And so I world. left that. Oh, I'm going to become Catholic. Transubstantiation, real presence, you know. Episcopalians, they're too light. And then I walk into a no sort of Catholic mass and it's, it's guitars and it's people walking up in a line to receive communion with their hands out. Wow. Wow. It's That's crazy. The, 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 the new, the Protestant convert is like, this is way too Protestant. <laughs> well, mean, it just wasn't reverent. You can't write this stuff. It well, wasn't yeah, I mean, reverent. And I mean, we knew what, that Catholic priests said it to the people, they said, you know, versus Popolum. I remember the Catholic bishop came to our big parish downtown to visit. And I said, would you like to see, you know, what it looks like inside? And he said, yes. And I brought him in and he looked around and he looked at our altar and he goes, uh, you say Ad Orientum here? I said, yeah, that's all we got. And he's like, wow. He's like wow. blown away. Yeah. He's like, don't you think that's too old? I mean, he's <laughs> like, don't you guys? No, I I, guess you no guys- he thought it was cool. He thought it was cool. And we were like not ashamed of it. Like, yeah, we've got the money. We could fix it. But why would we? It's awesome. It's a beautiful white carved marble that has a lamb in it, lamb of God. And then below the mensa is carved in the Last Supper in really beautiful Italian style. You trads. I know. You you Episcopalians. It's it's so weird. And you know what's crazy? In the altar was a cavity for a relic that was empty. And I was wow. told there was a legend at our Episcopal church that an old Anglo-Catholic priest had, we was, it was St. Andrews, had acquired a relic of St. Andrews and put it into the altar. Wow. To be tratty, to be Catholic. And then the next pastor came and found out about it and had it removed, the relic of St. Andrew. But then a curate hid the relic somewhere up in the rafters of the church, and it's still there to this day. That was one of our legends. Wow. I don't know. Very, very, uh, there's legendary. Anyway, I was coming, I was, there's no way I could have spent my whole life as a Roman Catholic in the Novus Ordo. I'm just, it's just not, I just can't. It's not what I, it's not what I know. Well, when we say, you know, my family, my little family, we're, we're trying to get out of California. And one of the reasons, there are a million reasons to make that move. But one of the main reasons is we don't live in a place. We live in probably the best, most conservative, most decent place in California, right, in the, in the southern Central Valley. But there's no FSSP. So I, right. I sit there. I know you, you go to modern day, and it's like there's no equivalent to that. So yeah. I'm stuck with the things that I'm complaining about today. Ha, ha, ha. I make the jokes. I, I, sound, I, I, you know, I try to sound lighthearted. You can ask my wife. I'm mad on Sundays. I'm yeah, not, not in the good. proper disposition. It's not. It's not the proper frame of mind to receive. So almost every week I'm getting mad about one or more of these. And we just we it's not what liturgy is. So before we can talk about this, we have to talk about what liturgy is. And, you know, this is the ground for any complaint we might make hereafter is that it fall, falls short of liturgy. Right. You tell us what that is. So liturgy is a Greek word, liturgia. And the first part there is where we get the word laity. Laos, if you put it in English letters, L-A-O-S means people. Laos, people. In Attic Greek, it's L-E-O-S. Right, there's like an eta there, I think. I don't think it's an epsilon, I think it's an eta in the Attic Greek. So that's why you see in liturgy in the Greek, liturgia, it's L-E-I-T. Um, so it means the people, and then it's the word ergon, where we get work, like synergy, energy, ergonomic, that word. So it's people, work, 
smashed together into one word. That's what liturgy is, people work. Now, in the 1950s and the 1960s, it became hugely popular to tell a lie. People didn't know it was a lie, but it was a lie. And that is, liturgy means work of the people. Yeah. So all the people need to be doing work. And if you're, they're not doing work activity, then it's not liturgy. It's bad. So we have to change the way liturgy is being done. Because, you know, if you went to a low mass in uh, 1954, there's the priest, there's one or two servers, and he comes in and, and he says the mass and he does the canon sotto voce, quiet, you don't hear it. The lay people don't get up and do or say anything out loud. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, that's wrong. It's work of the people. The priest is doing everything. The problem is, is liturgy doesn't mean work of the people. It means work for the people. Right. It's right. something done on behalf of another. Even in secular Greek, right. the word liturgy is usually refers to a public servant, even the emperor himself, who is doing public works for the people. Right? Right. Right. I mean, we, I think we talked about this before that in Romans, Paul even refers to the Roman emperor at that time, Nero, as a, in the Greek, liturgist, right? And he, he also uses the word diakonos, deacon. Right. Right. So it's the idea that he's doing something for the people. He's a worker for the people. Now we see, and then, but in the 60s and 70s, it was all work of the people, work of the people. And it's a lie. It's evil. Well, the, it's bad. So it's not this, true. There's this old debate, you know more about it than me, but I'm not trying to get into it. I'm just saying it, it's, uh, it's a Hegelian answer. It's actually both. Well, you know, was St. Paul a more Jewish thinker and more a Greek thinker? And, and, you know, I wrote a book on that Catholic respect I, I to Paul. I know it's, it's the, and, it's the middle book between my Jewish book and my Roman book, because Paul is the middle link between Jewish and Roman. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Jewish modes of thought, Greek modes of thought, and then Roman modes of thought, by and large, are, are attempting to reproduce the Greek ones. But the funny thing about St. Paul calling the emperor a liturgist is that's it's a very Jewish concept to conceive of a priest, maybe maybe not the emperor, but the priest as the worker, right? The sacri sacrificiant, the one who's doing the sacrifice. This, this is a Christian concept that de gets developed more robustly. When sacrifice, you know, the the Abrahamic, Isaiah uh, sacrifice becomes Jesus's, you know, Paschal sacrament, self-sacrifice becomes sacrament. But so it's more more Christian than it is Jewish, but it was Jewish first. That's right. And neither the Jews. Here's here's the ridiculous. Can I, can I insert something there just to promote to support what you're saying? King David was a king. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a Levite. And yet we see him doing liturgical things as the Messianic king. So again, right. it's Jewish. Right. That the king who is not, he's not part of the cultus of the temple, but yet by planning to build the temple and by bringing the Ark of the Covenant, he's doing, he's a liturgist. He's doing work for the people. Right. And to, to, to carry that point uh, one step further, and you get the mosaic thing where Mo Moses begins to uh, act in two capacities of two of the three priestly offices, sort of foreshadowing Jesus more than even his ancestor, David, right? Moses was a prophet and a priest, but not a king. David was just a king. Jesus, Jesus is going to be all three, and all three of them have this connection back to the liturgy. Um, yeah, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't anticipated that. But the point is— um, that, that's really interesting is it's, it's an utterly counter historical counterfactual um, embarkation for these silly baby boomers from the Vatican II era to have embarked on this argument that um, the mass is the work of the people rather than the work uh, for the people. The mass is the work by and of the people. Just, just no, no, it's because not, it's you're not. disregarding, 1962 years of Christianity. Christian, Christian, Christianity. And then, you know, whatever, 1500 yeah. years of Jewish history, whatever it is. 19. Yeah. Right. It's like, there is 3000 composite and then years. You can also just the, the Greek and Roman understanding of liturgy, even though it's pagan is also against that understanding. Is it? Well, yeah. I mean, 
they didn't all like gather around the uh, Sup- supreme pontiff in Rome pre Christ, the emperor, and hold hands around the altar. Right. And all, or, or all put their hands up together and do the blessing. No. Right. <laughs> like we, I mean, this whole idea that's the work of the people are why priests wrongly invite everyone up around the altar. I know. All the children in the... Yes. Was, or I've even seen one. it with adults. Or it's the whole idea of why the altar has to be pushed into the midst of the people. I hate that. Or in the, yeah. or in the round, because it's the work of the people. It's not the work of the people. It's work for the people. Here's a verse. Tim, Luke one twenty three. this is about St. Zachary. He's the father of St. John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. It says, this is talking about Zachary or Zacharias. When the time of his service was ended, he went back to his home. Luke one twenty three. The Greek there is liturgios. When the time of his liturgios was ended, he went to his home. So when his liturgy was over, he went home. Now, what was he doing? Well, we also know from Luke, he was in the temple burning incense the morning and evening incense. That's what he was doing. The Bible says he was doing liturgy. Does that mean he had a big group of people with him? No, they can't even come into the temple. It's just him by himself. Right. He's doing a solo ministry by its very definition is solo. I mean, there's other priests maybe around Levites, but there's no lay people in there at all. And yet the Bible says he's doing liturgy. Why? It's not work of the people. It's work of, for the people. He's for offering people. incense for the people of Israel. There's another one, he, uh, Hebrews 9.22. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. There the word is liturgios. Again, all the people of Israel didn't use those vessels. Only the priestly right. class used them. And yet, it's liturgical. So, we've got also uh, Hebrews 8.6. But the, as it is, Christ has obtained a liturgy, which is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So here, obviously, the ministry of Christ, we're not doing it. He's doing it for the people. Liturgy means for the people. So I think we've proven that. Everyone watching, if you ever hear anyone say liturgy means work of the people, you must correct them it's crucial it's it's this important evil and moi said there's only you know but well let me give a, a point of background on this evil and moi quote which i i'm always yelling at people <laughs> uh <laughs> oh my how i hate everything so so evil and moi says that uh the liturgy is not about participation right or, or it's about a certain kind of participation this is the watchword of liturgy by and yes. of the people is they say participation, 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 participation. Active, they say active participation. Yeah. Active participation, active. Mm. All participation is active people. Uh, again, uh, this is like saying an ATM machine. It's redundant. Participation right. says evil and uh, scoffing at all of this baby boomer foolishness the same way we are. He would do it with twice as much uh, uh, acidity in his system. He says, there's only one person who knows whether or not each participant in the mass, including the laity and the celebrant, the concelebrants or whatever, is actually participating. And it has nothing to do with the volume of their voice. He says, there's no need to shout, right? Prayer is silent, right? Most often. Now, you can come together and raise your voice in prayer, but Half the time with the Our Father, it's one of my my irritants here. There are two or three different things they do with it to butcher it. And it's just irritating. So I just say it silently. Not only am I not going to hold your hand, I'm not, you know, sometimes I, I just I kind of need to go into my own place and say a uh, silent meditative Our Father. Mm-hmm. And I'll have at the Catholic school, you know, or, or any of the Catholic parishes in town, people look. It's like there's no need to shout. You know, I'm yeah. participating and I don't. I just I go the other way when I start seeing everyone go go one direction. Well, you know, in in the Roman breviary before Vatican II, like the nineteen sixty breviary, sixty one is it sixty or sixty one breviary? I think it's sixty one. I think uh, it's sixty one. Yeah, but also in the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the old one that I pray I prayed to this morning, um, and also in the Latin Mass, the Our Father is said silently. It's not said out loud. It's can. It's obvious that everyone present knows it. You have, you know, you, everyone knows the Our Father. You don't have to say it out loud. And the liturgy assumes that that's an intimate moment 
where every single person communes with our Father, we're all His children, and it doesn't need to be shouted. It's done, in, it's done quiet. And then it says right. in Latin, but deliver us from evil. That's the last part. That's said out loud, just so you know the prayer's over. Right. But the rest of it said quietly. And I think that's beautiful. That's how, it's, that's how the Benedictines were doing it for century after century. That's how we should do it. So Again, we- I'm, not, I'm not trying to sound like super, uh, super awesome or whatever. But this is stuff I started doing in middle school, even before I kind of I never left the church, but I was just a a wishy washy guy, unconvinced. But even in middle school, high school, I had all these intimations and I'm like, I'm just going to say the Our Father silently. I mean, this this was my young Gordon's response to just a ridiculous 80s and 90s church. I'm like, I'm going to say this silently, you know, and then I then I went away for a period of not quite believing. And then I learned all this stuff. And brought me fully back into the yep. fold, and 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 I. I'm well, you intuitively, out you intuitively knew as a young man. Perhaps you are a prophet. Perhaps you had an interior illumination at a young age. But Just you say. knew that liturgy was for the people. It wasn't something that that you had to. I mean, you're actively doing something, but it's not. You're not performing in front of all the other people. And that's the distinction. Because if you think about, let's say there's a priest traveling, he's in Russia, there's no Catholic church nearby, and he says mass in his hotel room by himself. If liturgy is work of the people, he didn't do liturgy. Right, right. But we know he did do liturgy because he did it for the people. He did it for the dead. He did it for everyone back home. The mass was offered as a sacrifice. So liturgy has to be work for the people, not work of the people. Sorry to beat a dead horse, but... It's just such a horrible misunderstanding in our time. We have to make it clear. Well, here's another here's another um, element in all this. It's it's really a premise that that bulwarks all the things you've been saying in this first section here. Martin Luther, when he got more and more radicalized, when he's being sheltered in 1519, 1520, 1521 in Wartburg Castle, right? He's no longer just saying, let's let's quit having corrupt prelates doing corrupt things. He gets radicalized and it's like he begins to go out more and more on this limb that originally he wouldn't he never would have dared. He eventually when he's translating the Bible into German, he's coming up with all these other more radical ideas like the priesthood of all believers. Think about liturgia in the context of priesthood of all believers and what it does and, and, and think about how. Vatican II is just the extension, the spirit of Vatican II, I'll say to be safe here. I don't want, you know, angry emails or whatever. Or we're going to get, get angry, it doesn't matter. Okay, I don't want it from bosses in, in the diocese. <laughs> right. It's the spirit of Vatican II at the very least, which definitely seems to have preponderated and won out, won out and preponderated, I should say. Uh, it is just more extreme work than than Martin Luther did, except ostensibly it's from within the church. I mean, all people need to be actively participating. Well, this is because, you know, basically Luther was right, so the implication goes, that all people are priests. And what are you what are you doing, priests? Get off your get off your butt. You need to be distributing this Eucharist with your dirty hands. You ought to be clapping. You ought to be singing, you know, right. hey, hey, we're the monkeys with everyone out loud. You know, you ever do this is well, I don't want to get into it yet, but this would be yeah, you need to bring the list. gifts forward from the narthex with your family. Right. right. You know, oh, look how look at that family. You know, yes. look at that. that uh, another one child family. Look at those three people bring up. I mean, this is like the most common sight in your average Nova Sordo parish right. is like one, you know, the and, average and like, one and a half. Kids. Let's have as many Eucharistic ministers as po- possible. Let's put another one that was big after the council was let's put the council up. I mean, the council, let's put the choir up front so right. that people can appreciate them. Let's give them a round of applause and do a good job. Right. This is all You're nonsense. A bunch of them. They're they, all rolled into one here. You're hitting the choir was either in the back or if it was a monastic setting, it was up front and usually behind a root yeah. screen and facing each other. So you yeah. could hear each other antiphonally. It was never a performance right. for the people right. in the nave. This is all wrong. It's all bad. It's all, it's all ugliness. It's all ugly. That's the funny thing is none of it's beautiful. It's all uh, a kind of, uh, um, 
de-dignification of uh, a desanctification of the mass, a uh, a uh, 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 de-aesthetics to the mass. It's yeah, taking well, people, it. And, people call it pedestrian. I think that's a good. It makes the mass more pedestrian. You know, so. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth called it a banal accretion. Mm. I mean, he called the new mass banal, and, and right. I'm like, you said it, not me, bro, or or Holy Father, pa. whatever you call him now. Yeah, pa, what? Father Emeritus. Mm-hmm. Everyone take that however you will. But uh, yeah, the the music is probably the most striking to people. Do we want to start now? Or are you still going? Well, into I want to go. Th- you you have a list of them there that I think we want to go through. Before we do, though. I want to point out something again about the Novus Ordo, and that is it gives the power to the priest celebrant, the power of choice, which is extremely dangerous when you have a narcissist come around because in the, in the Latin, in the Latin mass, anything pre 62 or before, or even 65 before, but 62 before it's how we see it. You know, the priest showed up, there were, Black words that you said, there were red words that were rubrics. You had to do those. There was how much choice in that for the priest? Zero. In the new mass, well, which penitential rite should we do today? Should we write Mm -hmm. our own community penitential rite? Mm -hmm. Prayers of the faithful. Mm -hmm. We get to make those up. And guess what? It's it's odd, Tim. Explain this to me. How How is it that the prayers of the faithful always reflect the political sympathies of the pastor. How's that happen? Mm-hmm. It's so mm-hmm. weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so surprising that it's not. I mean, at all. He, it's a major part of the liturgy and he gets to compose them or he hires someone to compose them mm-hmm. and they can be whatever you want them to be. Right. That's dangerous. Of course. He can choose the most holy part of the mass, the Eucharistic prayer. He can say, yeah, I know we've been using the Roman canon for, you know, 1,500 years, but I'm going to choose not to. I'm going to use Eucharistic prayer, too, because it's faster, and people need to get to Luby's or IHOP. <laughs> Luby's. I remember Luby's out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they do. Well, it's, this is important it's stuff. It's choose right? your own. Choose your own adventure. And it, it, what it tells the priest after he gets out of seminary and he does this for five or ten years, I'm the Lord of the liturgy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can, I can move around the penitential rite. I can move around prayers of the faithful. I can move around the Eucharistic prayer. I can even do the Eucharistic prayer and omit saints if I want. It's all my choice. I have now become a supreme legislator, legislator on liturgy in my own parish. That gets into a man's head. It does. And then he starts changing other things. Now, we're going to, I know you're going to say this one. Add everything I just said with the priest facing the people. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Father Bob. Today, we're going to learn about Jesus when he got into a boat. That's how liturgy begins. And it's, it's a David Letterman talk show where he's facing the people. He right. chooses everything. It's extremely open to narcissism. I don't think that the new mass is simply open to narcissism. I think it's, strictly speaking, generative of it that it's con, you know, conducive to it in the sense that it's, it's meant to produce it in the breast of the sacrificiant, the priest. Yeah, I've never thought of it that way, but I think you're right, because you had great holy men who were saying the old right, and then were doing the wackiest stuff in 1975. Did their, right. How could their theology and their approach to the Mass change so suddenly from when they were ordained in the 50s or 60s to into the 70s and 80s? Well, think of it this way. Here's a bit of evidence. Well, we'll hear here are two bits of evidence. One's what you'd call strict material evidence. One is more experiential. I'll do the experiential first. With the most loosey goosey, liberal minded, bleeding heart priest in the land, and there are lots of them. What is the single point of liturgical strictness to which they are very seldom or, or very not inclined to offer any leniency? Be here by my homily, right? They want you. It's the it's the man show. It's the, the it's not it's not the priest. It's not them doing their thing. They don't really care. They don't notice if you're not on time if you go to a Latin mass, right? I mean, there there are rubrics, old rubrics for when you needed to be there. They actually made this rule up, right? There are strict rubrics for when you need you need to be there for the consecration. And as someone that I think the offertory, I've always heard the offertory. 
You got to be there the by offertory. offertory. Uh, a to make your priest. obligation. The offertory. But the offertory is still later than they typically. It's still I mean, after it's, the sermon. <laughs> yeah. it's still after the well, sermon. Not only so, that, Tim, but sometimes there is not a sermon in the Latin Mass. Right. There doesn't need to. Like really early in the morning or if you're in a place during the lunch hour and there's businessmen, they they can only get there at 12, 10 because they have to walk from their office and right. they got to be back at their office at one. Say the mass. Everybody right. saves the communion. You worship God, worship the Holy Trinity, go back to work. Right. But you still get the point of the mass. The point of the mass, the source of the summit right. is the Eucharist. So, but, but that, just think about that. Everyone, I mean, don't, it's not one of those things that has to strike you right where you sit, but but I, I think when people, I, I say this, and it's one of those things that um, my friends will come back two weeks later. Like I was thinking of what you said, the loosiest, goosiest bleeding heart in the land. They want you there for their, for the, the crown gem of what they take the liturgy to be. And that's their little homily where they can politicize you with all their garbage. Um, it's not the Eucharist. Uh, so that, that, that says something right there. They are in their own breast. They're having pride generated where maybe it didn't even exist before the ma- the, the, the open form of the mass begs beggars that what would Second, you say, the, oh, what would you say yeah. tim to cuz i thought when you were making your big lead up here you were going to say versus popolum because well it is yeah well yeah yeah i mean i guess, i guess it's it, the sermon is definitely facing the people with their own words that they made up but the whole liturgy is versus popolum, which just amplifies it. Because, you know, right. you could you could say, hey, why don't we do the Sanctus this uh, this weekend in Polynesian? And the priest would say, that's a great idea, very inclusive. Let's do the Polynesian Sanctus. Somebody looked that up, and uh, let's let's do let's talk about um, gender rights in the prayers of the faithful. Yeah, let's do that. You know, let's do ad orientum this Advent. No, we can't no. do. That's not allowed. The Holy Office, when when Cardinal Burke said, "Hey, everyone, just try that this this um, this liturgical season," the Holy Office oh, no, that was, was Cardinal on the Sarah. The next day, was, that it was Car- Sarah. Sarah, yeah. Sarah, yeah, it was Sarah. Sarah said, "Hey, everyone, just try this just for 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 s and gigs, right? Like, let's Give just all try to do it the real the real way." And the very next day, you had Greg Burke. Who hasn't said anything about the dubia, or I will not say one word, or the, what the Pope said about contraception in February 2016? He actually doubled down on it. No retraction, no redaction. But there was at that point. They said, "Oh, everyone, you don't have to do what Sarah said." You know, even yeah. though he's in charge of the office of, he's the the prefect for the office of divine liturgy. Don't listen to him, even though he's the master in the land on divine liturgy. That's when they. That's when the Vatican gets yeah. on the sticks. That's so yes, that's a that non-negotiable. Of, it's a non-negotiable for them. It is the beating heart more than even the language. People that are kind of you know low information Catholics. Most people say you go to the Latin Mass, and I'm like, well, one church in town does the Latin Novus Ordo. That's just kind of silly. It's a waste of time. It's not the language matters, but the big issue is the liturgical you know, orientation, the, the posture. Yeah. The orientation at the consecration. That's, that's number one for me. And I think people that try to understand what the mass is really about, but, but I'm curious that, what you would think to, I know you're going to talk about communion the tongue, but what do you think is, if you could only change one thing, it's just like Pope Francis calls, he says, Hey, I'm right now at a motor proprio right now. And I, I like your videos, Tim, you and T Marsh, T Gordon, good stuff. And I'm just going to give you one, wish genie in a bottle what, what would you change would it be ad orientum would it be communion on the tongue the abolishing yeah communion the well, hand? Off, that's just that's a weird question because he i didn't tell you but he did just call me this is not a hypothetical well, i didn't He's want like, the Tim, i didn't want to i didn't bro? want the audience to know that that actually happened so i was kind of doing a yeah, little yeah 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 you're being humble <laughs> yeah no he's like hey i watch uh t marsh and t gordon that's why that's why greg dope. burke re- that's why greg burke resigned because yeah, he didn't approve yeah. of us of him taking counsel with us on this right Right. That's right. That's, that's, that's weird that you pitched that as I book. No, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the ad orientum, you got to go with that, but it would be killer Ooh, to only have close. one. I don't know. I think I'd go, I, I would abolish communion on the hand first if I only had one. So, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. So yeah. You only have one, Tim. That didn't come with, if that didn't come with the, you know, 1970 missile. So 
came True. out too. That came after. That True. Came, it's well, actually not part before. of this. Came after. Well, came it, it started happening in Germany and Belgium and Holland and France earlier. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't. Well, those things almost go hand in hand. I mean, it's sort of a Michael Scott kind of cop out saying, really, really, <laughs> I get these too. But I mean, the, the Eucharistic, let's just say this, the Eucharistic abuses are abuses to Jesus's DNA, right? His body and blood. Well, and, and, his, and his divinity and his soul. It's the whole person. It is divinity and soul, body, blood, yeah, soul, you're, divinity. You're offending so, the divine person, the logos. Right. What, it's serious. Uh, the, like This isn't like T. Marsh and T. Gordon like joking around like, oh, it's so dumb. At the end of that day, I mean, we always do some joking around because we talk about heavy stuff. And if we if we didn't, people would just pass out of the gravity of some of the things we discussed. But, but look, this is God. I mean, can't mess around with this. This is sacrilegious. Yeah. This is sacri- I mean, this is sacrilegious to the body and blood and the soul and the divinity of God. We've been so desensitized to it that we're almost like insensate. You know, we it's so, so much desensitization, you, you lose a feel for reality. And that's, that's what's happened with respect to the Eucharist. Right. So, yeah, I would, I mean, how do you, how do you weigh those two? We're literally you know, turning think, your back on God versus touching him with your dirty hands. I mean, let's, and the, yeah, let's say like the, versus Populum attacks the idea that the mass is a sacrifice. Instead, the yes. priest is offering it to us where he goes, this is my, and he does like the spray of the crowd. Right. 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 But if he was right. saying it over here the at spray. this, you actually didn't get sprayed because it was still bread. It's actually the people on his right, if he was going left or right, they they got a little Eucharistic benediction in his... his sea world style? Yeah, yeah like, yeah. what is that? You know, where he yeah. did, you know what I'm talking about? Where yeah. they do the... Yeah, no, I know. They do know. the uh, in the round. Check this out. Keep yeah. this, bro. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't... So yeah. that's like saying, basically, because in the Eucharist, uh, the priest is offering Christ to the Father, to the Eternal Father, to Iji to her. I mean, that's the, that's the canon. He's not offering it to like spray us. No. Right? No. Right. So that's a problem. And then communion in the hand is really more of an attack on the real presence. It's it's degrading the presence of Christ and and bringing it into to a more common food that we handle and that we touch. I mean Yes, I know there are examples in the patristic era where people would take communion home and persecution. And the, but we're talking about the catacombs, people. We're not talking about right now, this year in America. Right. Even in right. the East, in the West, unless you're in holy orders, you can't touch the Eucharist. You can't touch so it. So let, let's order them this way. Because I, I didn't order them aside from the Eucharistic liturgical abuses are far and away the most egregious. So say, let, let's take these two, and, and the rest of them are not ordered, though they're somewhere ontologically below the desecration happening here, right? Like so crummy songs. Yeah. yeah. Crummy songs are really bad, but they're somehow lo- less, <laughs> yeah, yeah, less they're, offensive they're to bad. our Lord. But so Eucharist in the hand, and let's say by foot, you know, people that are standing not on their knees. Yes. You know? Well, I mean, the, in the Eastern Rite, they do stand. You have the screen though, so you the do. screen behind, so it, it's it's not like right. But you but you would you would not have an Eastern Christian ever touch the Eucharist. No way. So no way. I, I want to tell when I was when I, I had a student once who was an Ethiopian Orthodox, and we invited them to the Latin baptism of one of our children, one of our babies. I think it was baby number seven or six. And the Ethiopians came, Ethiopian, Ethiopian, and they were hardcore. Like they didn't eat any meat during Lent, and they slept on the floor oh, during wow. Lent. Yeah, they were like real Orthodox, you know. They're like Christians. Yes, yeah. and the dad, really good, sweet guy, Ethiopian man. He told me he's like, you know, we're not that far from you, but we have a few differences. And I said, oh yeah, what's that? Because I was just curious what he's going to say. And he says, well, we don't believe that you can have females serving at the altar. Love it. Yeah, he said, um, our priest can marry. And in his big one was, we don't touch the Eucharist like y'all do. Love it. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm kind of with you on two of the three there all the way, buddy. You know, but it wasn't, right. it's a baptism and I can't get into debate. But I just thought it was interesting for 
for an Ethiopian layman, in his mind, that's what made a Roman Catholic different from an Ethiopian Orthodox. Female oh, altar servers. Yeah. Touching the Eucharist. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. And, and married clergy, which is, which is an obvious one. But, you know, these things matter. Oh, very, very much. And, and don't they also have ad orientum? They have ad oh, yeah. orientum. Oh, yeah. Consecration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's so the so, so take they have, a, they have a screen and they're ad orientum. Right. Just like is, just like the Greeks, just like the Russians. All the people say, well, the Greeks and the Russians have freestanding altars. And they say it ad orientum with the freestanding altar. They don't say it facing the people. Right. Which makes the difference. Right. But in, yeah, so I, I look, you get you get an altar screen and I'm down. I'm fine with doing I mean, give me the Byzantine. Right. And I'm fine with people taking that. Right. On the on the mouth standing. But I'm talking in the ridiculous. Right. Roman. Right. The new Roman. Right. People standing in their sweatpants and bad tennis shoes, slack jawed, touching it with their dirty hands. Those are the first two after a consecration. And you're receiving popular. communion from a dear, sweet this is number three. grandma in her Christmas sweatshirt that has reindeers and bells on it. The, the, that so this jingle. is number three. Yeah. That yeah, jingle. The, that jingle. If they didn't jingle, it would be fine. <laughs> No, that's the thing. I, so yeah, we need to talk about EMs. This is where I was going. And yet so-called extraordinary ministers, they're not extraordinary at all. That Extraordinary means it doesn't happen often, right? Yeah, um, extraordinary. It, it, extraordinary is supposed to be people. And if you ever, if you go to my parish, some people are now coming up to me because they recognize me from this podcast. At one of the parishes I go to in town, you see I'm tripping over people. You know, half the time we're just standing in the 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 lobby in the back in front of the narthex like because we're getting there a little bit late <clears throat> you got a kid Partly you, I don't wanna, you, you got a kid missing one shoe that happens to us sometimes yeah several kids <laughs> missing one shoe it, it, many of my kids aren't clad in any shoe they're not shod at all uh, discount <laughs> but right discount <laughs> But but we we the the girls are the older girls are wearing the uh, veils and we're there and you'll usually see me tripping over the the lobby EMs that you know excuse me or get out of the way then I I have to like train it's like you know line jumping lane jumping in traffic when you live in L A or Houston someplace with bad traffic or you're going here to there I got I go and I receive from the priest. Um, and there, this is what we call at law. If a landlord's not getting help from the sheriff, self-help, right? This is self-help. I'm not going to receive the Eucharist from the usually female EM, like 90% of them in my parishes are, are female, right. but even a male, I, I just, I don't want to, it's gotta be an ordained third, you know, third order or better for me to take it. Usually I just go for the priest. So it's not extraordinary at all. If it was extraordinary, by the way, then this would be something you see at like huge masses, like uh, right. Miracle stadium. of Loaves and Fish. Yeah, yeah, stadium masses. Okay, I get it. But Which I'm not a fan it, of. Well, I'm not a fan <laughs> no, of that either. Yeah, Super, yeah. But at least then it would be true to the definition, the requirements, the denotation of the word extraordinary. But it's every mass. Half the time with the real Vatican II dinosaurs in town, I try to avoid their liturgies, but I can't do so perfectly. They will stay seated up at the front. And they will just have the EMs. Yeah, that's bad. That's a great. Have you ever seen that? Oh yeah, that's egregious. It's egregious. You've seen them just chilling. They're like, I'm just up here hanging, eating some apps. Like, well, 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 these people do it. It's like, no, this is this is a direct. This is where you get into an issue of prudence with these three top issues. The lesser ones that are not Eucharistic desecrations by their nature, you could you can make an argument. OK, sit there. Shut up. It's Tim Gordon, you're not J.R.R. Tolkien. Maybe even he should have shut up. Don't yell about it in mass, which is what I'm usually doing. If you're sitting within three pews, I mean, this is where I, you just need to find a Latin mass if you're a guy like me, because um, I just get mad. I'm saying stuff, but it could go either way. But the top three, the Eucharistic decorate uh, desecrations are like. Dude, am I incurring sin for bearing witness to this? 
Like, am I? I don't. That's how I felt no, when I saw the lady palm the Eucharist. I had to chase her down. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I should be praying right now and I'm having to chase somebody down to their pew to see if they're going to put the Eucharist in a witch's purse or something. Right. I know. I know. So it's real. what people, notwithstanding all our, our jokes and all that, like you said, this is the DNA, you know, of Jesus in, in the, you know, form, form and matter, you know, in, under the species of bread and wine, this is literally Jesus's body. And we are, we're allowing these goofballs to handle well, it, you know? Okay. So there's some, there's probably a hundred people watching right now that are you Christian ministers and they're like, well, I'm not a goofball. Okay. I understand that these people are, um, and honestly, when I first converted and I came into the church, the priest had me, uh, he's like, okay, uh, you're going to serve this mass and then uh, you're going to help me distribute. And I was like, okay. And I felt really weird about it, but I was like, well, let's, Episcopalian priest, I know how to do it functionally, but anyway, I don't do it anymore, obviously. But there's people out there who do it, and a lot of them do it out of piety. They're like, I love the Eucharist, I want to be close to the Eucharist, this is a way for me to, you know, to do that. Somebody uh, in one of our videos recently, I just saw in the scrolling live chat, they're like, they said, I'm a Eucharistic minister, but I always receive on the on the tongue. It's like, well, that's good, but you're now also giving it to people on the hand times 500, Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, so why bother? Yeah, I mean, know? for me, Timothy, there was a blog post I did several years ago. It was probably ten years ago that that really blew up, and it was the Grover T-shirt. Did you ever see this one? A lot of people know me for this post was the Grover T-shirt. I was at a mass, and I was struggling with everything you were doing. I was still going to Novus Ordo, and I went up for communion, and the Eucharistic minister was wearing a Grover T-shirt. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. It's a giant blue shirt with the face of Grover, like this big, right? And he's like the body of Christ. And I was receiving you. He was like, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> for, thou for a thousand years, the Catholic Church has been embroidering the most beautiful vestments for priests to wear because of the sacredness of the Eucharist. And I'm literally receiving the logos, the second person in Trinity, while staring into the blue shirt, the blue face of Grover from Sesame Street. Yeah, the, the body and blood of Christ, the, mount the very mountains cover their ears and tremble before the logos of all creation. And you got some goofball with the... <laughs> With I've a, never heard this. With the Grover. I've never heard this. And that was, you, I'll send you the, the link. Y'all can all Google yeah. it. Just put in uh, Taylor Marshall, Latin Mass, Grover moment, something like that. That was my Grover moment. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't <laughs> want to receive Jesus and look into the eyes of Grover. And, and nice. it's of Sesame Street. I don't we're, want we're Muppets. The looking glass. I don't want Muppets in the Mass. And so that was it, man. After that, I was like, Latin Mass, here I come. No turning back. That, that was it? So that, that was it. Was literal, yeah, that was it. That was it. I, that's a good time to leave. Here's what I, I wrote. I just, I just pulled it up. As I inwardly, as I turned to the pew, I thought inwardly, the church is empty of any Catholic images, statues, or icons. The only icon that I can gaze into at this moment is the Eucharistic minister's Muppet shirt. This is ridiculous. I don't want my children to grow up with the with this as the perception of the one true faith. Right. I had seen worse things than this before, but for some reason, the Grover moment broke me. Grover, mo <laughs> the Grover moment broke Seriously, me Seriously, this peace. church had not one statue or image in it. The only right. image in the church was the face of Grover. Right. So, so step back for a moment after, after the Grover story. 30,000 feet above the, the surface of the earth, and take a take a broad sort of sweeping panoramic. When when we get the occasional comment, it's it's nice. It's not all that frequent in the comment boxes for our videos. Like, you know, are, are you guys are buying into the the infiltration narrative, hook, line, and sinker? What if this is wrong? Don't you feel? For one thing, there's so very very much corroborating evidence. You know, but. Then there's and, and I guess this is just well, one more. Well, there's Paul drop the six. The, Paul the six, the orchestrator. He says, through some fissure, the smoke of Satan is into the church. The 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 uh, sanctuary. Even he says this. So he's talking about the liturgy and 
the body of Christ kind of is one by using that term, the sanctuary. And he's referencing, you know, what Jesus had to do, casting out the money changers, that using that term, the sanctuary is very comprehensive. But so this is not just one more drop in the comprehensive ocean of uh, evidence that this there this is a massive infiltration. But it's it's a different kind almost of evidence. It's experiential. Think of how widespread this stuff is. I mean, everyone everyone has their own Grover moment. Anyone who's watching with eyes to see has like, yeah, this that's a funny story. Ha ha ha. It was Grover. For me, it was a guy in a, you know, don't me- don't mess with Mr. Zero moving van t-shirt. It's like, you know, it you might have different slightly different experiences, but it's utterly ubiquitous from sea to shining sea around the globe, around the first world countries of the world. After Vatican II, this stuff happened. And you have the moderates in the church that will say, um, you're you're committing a fallacy, post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? Just because something's after X doesn't mean it was caused by X. Well, not necessarily. Right. That is a, a, a very funny, Tim. Fact. I used to say that regarding the liturgy, I would just always say, well, you're making post hoc propter hoc. It's wrong. I used to say that exactly as you said. But Did now, you? That's yes, funny. but not anymore. That's funny. Yeah, because there, I mean, post hoc ergo propter hoc is a fallacy because you're not even attempting to demonstrate to get past correlation. Yeah, just you're explain not it for people because we're, we're speaking Latin. Not everybody has studied logic or knows Latin. It just means uh, if every time, you know, the let's say you're getting indigestion at dinner, you know, most people that get indigestion, get it after dinner because it's it's the biggest, most acidic, most caloric meal of the day. But let's say you say, you know, I every time I get indigestion, it's just after the moon has risen because dinner happens to be there. So um, you'd be committing the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy if you said. The moon brings about my indigestion. No, no, no. It's much more linked to which meal, how caloric, how rich. And right. it's usually dinner is the worst of the day. So it does happen almost 10 out of 10 times after the moon, but it doesn't mean it was caused by the moon. It, it correlates with the moon rising in a secondary sense because it correlates with a meal of dinner, which usually correlates with the moon rising. But uh, you have to get to causation. What we're showing you here today in a hopefully you know entertaining way or whatever is the the divine liturgy, which was changed very uh, comprehensively, very designedly, you know, in in 1970, was it it worked all these changes and it was intended to work all these changes. And the evidence that I keep pointing to is what we call negative evidence. It's the fact that there there are all these errors, even according to Sacrosanctum Concilium, a Vatican II document, there are all these errors, and they're never corrected. That's a negative bit of evidence. They're never corrected. Why, why not? Um, yeah, so those three Eucharistic ones are a really big deal. You, you, EMs, so-called, reception by hand, you know, often standing, and consecration versus populum. Those ones are basically, you asked what's the biggest one. Those are all non-negotiables. Yeah. So I, I couldn't really pick between them. They have, all have to go. Have you had the experience of being rebuked or corrected when it comes to receiving it on the tongue by a priest or did, a Eucharistic minister? Didn't I tell you? Uh, well, I know. My, I'm just, my, my I'm wife just, I'm was... I'm giving you some... My wife, I'm tossing yeah, you a bone here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> already shared this. No, I mean, I told you about... I don't want to be too specific, but in, in town here, my wife was corrected, was was denied on the mouth. I, and I might not have actually shared this with you. I can't remember because it would have been right around the time we started was denied. I, you know, he made her, she just stood there awkwardly. She didn't create a fight. I just would have stood there, but the, the gentler sex, she just felt awkward. And I don't remember if she ended up receiving, I think she received it on the hand and just left and felt horrible. Told me I went, I bolted to my car, got my iPhone, got up the, the letter of dispensation generated by the Holy Office in 68 or 69. And it says, like, in bold, the original way of receiving will never, ever be abrogated or something like that. So I went in there, took it to the priest. He's like, well, if you don't like receiving on the hand during cold and flu season, then you can go somewhere else in town. I said, 
No. And, and he said, you know, this is this comes from the diocese. And I said, well, look, this is this is the boss's boss's boss. And I got a, I happen to have a letter from him. See, it signed there. Paul the sixth, baby. And yeah. I was like, never abrogated. And he didn't like that. But yeah. yes. So, yes, I have. And and in town, they'll get mad at me if I kneel, um, if mm-hmm. it's not one of the priests that I know. Mm-hmm. If, if you go up there and kneel, which takes, you know, 0.5 extra seconds. Right. And what's remarkable is in in the Latin mass, you come up and you kneel while other people are leaving while the priest is going by. It's very fast. It's, it's remarkably efficient. fast. And the priest is just going down the line. Typewriter. Yeah, it's, Type it's incredibly how fa- it's incredible. I, I would we should do we should do a show, Tim, where we just we don't do yeah. a really mass, but we like get a line and we actually time it. We do like That's a 10 a minute idea. show and we, we need to get like uh, 300 volunteers. That's right. And we, we mock up and we do a stopwatch of a standing like one. And then we do a kneeling one, the same amount of space, same amount of people and, and publish the results. That, why not that even not matters. That? One's reverend, one's not. But just the argument is, well, that would take forever with a big parish. No, it wouldn't. Right. Because people, uh, be, it matters because people make the pragmatical argument and the pragmatical argument loses on its face. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, why has no one done that? We, we need to get Dude Perfect to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're de- yeah, they're right yeah. down the street from me here in Texas. I could call up Dude Perfect. Hey, man, we got to do a Latin Mass episode. Do it. Would they, I wonder if they'd be <laughs> I amenable. Think, I don't think they would. They're good, they're no, it's, <laughs> the point is it's the ultimate blend of pragmatic and reverent because the varying need felt by the, variant commu- the various communicants – some people want to sit there for a little bit afterwards. That doesn't hold up the line one bit. If you got 10 communicants in the typewriter on the altar rail, right? And two of the 10 at any one time. But like, I want to pray for a little bit at the rail. Yeah, that never it happens, hold it though. Up. Yeah, but it never happens. Even it doesn't happen. It, it wouldn't hold it up. You're right. But it doesn't even happen because you go back to your pew and it's not like you're rushed because you have to have some time with the Lord. In the Latin Mass, you have a good another. Five ten minutes of actual prayer with the Silence. Lord instead right. of in the Novus Ordo here. Well, we have a couple of announcements this week, right? And right. it's interesting too because I've learned in the Catholic Church, couple means five or six. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's yeah, weird. That's right. I, I was like couple with two, but in the Catholic Church, a couple announcements means five. That's a. I think that's a boomer thing. I hate just, that too. Know. Like we just received Jesus Christ. Do you know where traditional announcements go before the homily? Like if you go to that's Latin right. Mass. Right, they read the they read the epistle, the gospel. Um, they'll you sometimes say a prayer, have some words about the saint of the day, and then they'll say whatever the announcement is. And it's, it's usually because, not, "Hey, we have some really tasty looking Danishes today in the fellowship right, hall." Right. Yeah. <laughs> the the idea was you stick all the profane stuff where people are spitting raps at y'all <laughs> in one segment, right? right? Where it's like, "Hey, we're gonna be you know kind of being ordinary." in this heavenly, you know, 45 minutes or hour, and we're going to get it all out of the way. Yeah. They doing it right after when I'm trying to, you know, finish decades of a rosary or a prayer of Thanksgiving. I don't appreciate it too much at all. We have someone come up and talk about our Catholic school system and how you should donate towards it. Right. 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 But it's always, and a lot of it is money. It's always money. I mean, 75% of the time it's, it's monetary by its nature, which is, does not go with, does not, it's not a nice uh, digestive. Yeah, for how are you supposed to communion? make a Thanksgiving after communion and write a check? Right, right, right. And tell your kids, no, we're not going to get the Danishes. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they're like, lemonade oh. at my church and the kids are always thirsty. And so they're like, can we get the lemonade? And I'm like, is it? Because the churches always want money for it. It would be nice if they just had it and they're like, well, give a donation. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be the guy. I don't carry a lot of cash on me, you right. know? So it's, it creates this Danish slash lemonade conversation that I just, I'd, I'd be happier without. And anyway, yeah. Yeah, you need to go to modern day, dude. That's my I, period. I do. I do. Or, or just if I lived a little further south in LA, there's plenty of SS. I mean, yeah, I don't want to live what, in LA. Uh, St. But- Vitus, is that it down there? There's the the FSSP. Yeah, yeah. There's in there's LA. two. Okay. I think there's two, and I don't. There. Oh, well, there's one in LA. There's one Orange County. Uh, 
And um, I think I think St. Vitus is close to it's off the 110 or something. Yeah. What about the Norbertines? They, what you ever been over there? Uh, I I have priest friends from St. Uh, Michael's, is yeah. it in Orange County? Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple priest friends that that are Norbertines there. They're basically as good. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the very best orders out there. There's a Norbertine convent in. Tehachapi in the mountains above Bakersfield here, we go and we help them out sometimes. We built fences with them, my family and I, and some of my students. So the so Norbertines are awesome. It's practically FSSP. But um, Hey, Catholics don't build walls. They build bridges, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, these Catholics <laughs> build walls. They build fences. <laughs> From behind 32, 32 or 34-foot Vatican walls. Right. You're going you're gonna to decry all walls. Uh do you want to hit some of these other yeah, ones? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Let's do it. So I have, this is not a 95 or 98% one. This one is just a couple of the, the biggest libs in town. One of whom is retired would say, and I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing it out there because I just want to hear if anyone's ever heard this um, or if it's just this guy made it up. It's uh, for us men and for our salvation. Literally I, during the prayer, the priest every time would drop off. For us and our salvation, he would get rid of the the men specific yep. language, which is just you just right. want to just want to put one of those right in the yeah. Not a I fan. Mean, that, well, there yeah, was there just, was a priest at the University of Dallas when I was doing my PhD there, who um, who would do changes to male pronouns in the canon, and people right. I've walked out of masses. You know, it's like have you? Yeah, you hear that? I'm like, look, you're you're changing the mass. You're changing. Not just the rubrics, but the words for your, for your agenda. Yeah, it's narcissistic. Right. Utterly narcissistic. You're supposed to be in persona Christi, obedient to the Father, and yet you're disobeying in the liturgy? And I we're know. all supposed to stand here and watch you do this? No. I know. It's, it's outrageous. It. Oh, and speaking of narcissism, I never got to this point. One, the, the last bit of historical evidence I wanted to adduce about the narcissism is that the Novus Ordo is kind of the, the way it's often done spirit of Vatican two styled Novus Ordo 95 to hundred percent of them are, uh, the reason they're, they're also cannot just be said to be evincing of a parent of some hidden hubris within the celebrant, but also even even within the non-prideful priest, it, it generates some by its very nature, uh, the liturgical abuses, is because this was part of the, if you go back and you look at the Alta Vendita, the Freemasonic project, they said it, it's a city of God, city of man thing. We want to make this new universal one world global religion. Uh, the Freemasons are always say, oh, we all believe in God. It's going to be a humanistic religion where God is, where man is at the center, not God. You get this really, really finely, uh, really uh, starkly in in the new mass, right? All, yeah. all this stuff we're talking about. So that that's just one thing I was going to add. And, there. and and even the advocates of the nineteen sixty nine seventy Pauline mass, they say it's more about the community, it's more about the people, right? Which means man. They don't yeah, say I city know, of God, city man. Yeah, it means that what we're saying. They're right. admitting it. It's an admission Precisely. by a party. But they they say it in, in a positive spin, but they're saying it nonetheless. It's still an admission with a positive spin. Yep. Uh, I mean, some of them, it's kind of like recips a luck winner. Some of my complaints are like, I'm sure most people watching your show, watching Taylor Marshall are like, duh. But um, like for us men and for our salvation, you take out the, the sex specific pronouns and, you know, you're just you're you're a baby boomer uh, moron. And, and people probably don't like it already. But. Our Father handholding and the Our Father mm. song, I don't, I don't care for. But the yeah. handholding is really offensive. And I um, don't do it, and no one, in, none of my kids or my wife do it. We're the like weird people who don't do it. So we, are we? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. I mean, it's obviously, just, it, no, you don't do it. And of course, the great thing is when you're at the Latin Mass, it's not an issue. No, well, none of this is. I mean, literally, not one What's of these. What's amazing issues is it's not like ninety nine percent of these problems or ninety percent are fixed by going to the Latin Mass. It's 100. People say, Point zero. well, there was, yeah. there was abuse. There was a lot of liturgical abuse before uh, Vatican II in the Latin Mass. There was a lot, and you always say, well, what was it? The priest said Mass really fast. Yeah, I know. It's that's like, every that's not... single time. 
hundred yeah. percent. I and even priests will say, well, there's a lot of liturgical abuse before Vatican II in the Latin Mass. And I say, for example, the priests said it really fast, it's really fast. Oh, oh, oh! In number two, old ladies are just saying they're just praying too much during Mass. They just be praying their beads. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, that's that's so abusive, bro. Like, what are you talking about? I know. Neither of these are a problem. Look, I'm not one of these holy rollers. I'm fine with a short Mass. Like, I I want to observe my obligation. I love everything right. about the latin mass but i'm i'm cool with with that because i got stuff to do anyway this yeah. is most important well, especially when you have children with you you know if there's a little homily at the beginning and then there's a little mini homily at the gospel and there's a full homily at the gospel and then there's five to six announcements and you got eight kids in tow in a row it's like come on father let's get going these kids are hungry this one's thirsty this one's got to, about to pee his pants i mean you right. got a big deal you got a big thing going on here and i i don't I don't really have any patience for the accretions. I don't like the accretions. I, I like that. This father one's is... about to pee her pants. This one did pee her pants. Yeah. This one pooped his pants. <laughs> right. Like, come on, just let's get to the, <laughs> the get source this. in the summit. Yeah let's, yeah. Get, let's get this going, you know? Yeah. Hmm. And, and okay. So that brings us to the next one that, that is arguably the, in terms of all, Oliver Wendell Holmes said that every every jurist has a gut check moment where they they're not willing to rule on a given law, even if it's consistent with the Constitution, and they should. It's gut check. The most gut checky element of liturgical abuse, maybe even more striking than the more important communion ones, are the the hymns, right? Which are the main thing, by the way, that hold up the mass time in these long, oh. boring banal, desecratory Novus Ordo Masses are the hymns. It's not chant. Um, and what, it's, it's basically monkey's music. It is the pinnacle the, of... What's, here's what's interesting. Boomer the Catholic-written hymns from the 60s, 70s, and 80s are so horrific. They're <laughs> B-rate Broadway tunes. They just sound mm -hmm. like Broadway tunes to me. The good hymns are actually the Protestant hymns. They are. The, yeah, the so there's no ones. winning with yeah. this, you know, no. you know, amazing grace is a good traditional hymn, but it's Protestant, right. you know, a mighty fortress is our God is Luther, like the classic. Now the, I will admit I'm probably partial. Some of the really good hymns come from the Anglican tradition. They do. But that being said, you know, and there are hymns in the Latin mass, but there's the tradition of sacred music and of chant. And the introit and, you know, all these things and the divine office is part of the great Roman tradition, the liturgical tradition. In the Latin churches, like during Holy Week, you experience the glory of Holy Week. That's right. Right. And a, lot right. Of, a lot of people are getting to the pre-1955 pre Holy Week, which is exciting. So you get this stuff. It's not these really saccharine hymns. The saccharine is the word. That a Jesuit wrote in Chicago in 1984. Yeah, and a lot of I. Someone told me that they were basically all the written, hymns are all written by James Martin's friends, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, there was seventy five percent of them were written in the spring of sixty eight or sixty nine, mm -hmm. and it's like talk about time dated. You know, me and you are always talking about like classic rock. What's really great, <laughs> Led Zeppelin? Why is Zeppelin so good? Because it doesn't sound like it's from the sixties or seventies. It's just timeless. It right. stands up. But it the monkeys, like the monkeys, sound like they're from sixty-eight. The monkeys, yeah. I can tell what was happening in the culture just by listening to that ridiculous tribe, right? right? And that's yeah, they all sound like monkeys songs. Um, so that that's that's just it's it's really bad. It strikes people. The stu you know, I teach high school students. They're all giggling during the music, and literally all have. Other teachers, usually it's it's non-Catholics or non-practicing Catholics, will jab me in the ribs. And they'll be like, oh, oh, should we go talk to this student? They're laughing at the music. I'll say no. I mean, I'm, I'm not a liar, dude. Right. Like, this is funny music. It's Would funny. they be it's... laughing in Dies Irae? Right. No. Right. Ex exactly. About the, the funerary mass <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Yeah. No, they would not No be. one laughs at Dies Irae. Yeah. It, it, you're like, this is amazing. And then right. I show them. I show them um, every beginning of the school year. I show them. It's a very popular version of the Liturgy of the Saints that's on YouTube. If you just type in Liturgy of the Saints and it's got the saints that pop up. You mean like the Litany, the like, litany of the Saints? Lit litany oh, yeah. of the Saints. Right, right. Litany of the Saints. Sorry. Like the Talking traditional so Litany of the Saints. Gotta, 
Yeah, just just YouTube it. There's one that's got kind of a, bra- uh, a beautiful brownish kind of marble background, and various saints pop up. I use it to show the. Di- I use it to show we don't pray to the saints because at the beginning it's right. like miserere nobis, then yeah. it comes ora pro nobis. Yeah. And the Protestants are always like, oh, okay, that's a good point. Yeah, but the, but the English one is pray for us, pray for us. St. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure, pray for us. It's like a Broadway show. It is. It is. It's, and, and, the, and the composition isn't that good, even though it, sound, yeah. it sounds dumber language to language in the English. But the composition is like a, like a bad Broadway tune. It, it's not yeah. catchy. Ironically, the the traditional hand, uh, chant is very oh I know it's, very catchy, and I do yeah. not get mad at students for laughing at it. That yeah, is yeah, the yeah. proper Saint response. Charles Borromeo, pray for <laughs> yeah. us. It's like what? <laughs> it's it's what it is. Is um, did you ever see the M Night Shyamalan movie called The Village? Just say M like Night. A, I no one knows how to say the last name M Night. Yeah, I always said Shyamalan because I think that sounds the most right. But people, but always yes, laugh I have. Is that the one where they the the crazy coal people dress up? Yes. Yes, I've seen. And, it, and it's present day. Guess who? Because I am. I'm not saying I'm a linguist or anything, but guess who called it like 20 minutes in? This is present day. They're cult or something, and they just went to like a section of the present day woods. Like right. that was yours truly. And how? Because they did. You're a genius. This is what I'm saying about the the mass, the language in the mass. It's like they're trying to write semi, semi uh, reverent song lyrics, but in the with with little flourishes that are super timely. That's what they were doing in the village. And it just sounds dumb. It sounds wrong. It sounds gauche. It's off. And everyone hates it, and it gives itself away. Yep. That's exactly what happens in the mass, where it's like, well, we're gonna we're gonna name this hymn "Go and Make a Difference," but we're gonna talk about we're gonna throw in some flourishes that are really describe Jesus's body. It's like you're dumb, and and no one likes you. Whoever wrote that song, <laughs> I, I hate it. I play that song, and for my students, and they all laugh. And I say, so am I mad at you for laughing? What a what a perverse concept. Yeah. Laughing is the only properly intellectual disposition for someone who hears this song. There's a, there's a little YouTube thing. It's got like 5 million views. You might've seen it. I might've sent it to you called, um, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine by a seventies band called Sunseed. And it's the funniest, the S O N S E E D It's the funniest thing you've ever seen. I was like, this is basically post Vatican two music. Everyone go look up. Jesus is a friend of mine. You will laugh out loud. It, It it's, it's pretty famous by this okay. point. And that's basically yeah, what it's we like have the, in uh, It's like the Elvis clip we talked about with uh, Michael right. Voris. Right. When he's just kind Except of Except Elvis out. still made good music, at least. That's right. the difference. Yeah. But it's still cringeworthy when you watch it. When you see of Elvis course. moderately moving his hips and singing, right. let us pray or come, come gather and pray, whatever the chorus is. Right. And you see the kind of nun kind of doing her thing and yeah. all the women yeah. with their chapel veils on kind of getting with the beats it's cringeworthy <laughs> it's cringy as they say but yeah at least at least elvis could carry a tune he shouldn't have been doing right. that with his hips the boy had but skills like, what were the boy had skills what is with that you probably heard this a million times okay even if you have a horrible voice we want you to sing they're trying this is freemasonic look when you have a bad voice we don't want you singing. And instead, that you're being encouraged to sing. It's socialism. If you have a bad voice and you sing, it's going to bring down the harmony. They don't even sing harmony, but it's going to bring down the melody. It's going to throw it off. It's going to. It's it's the perfect right. Freemasonic design to disrupt the aesthetics. Right. How beautiful! How what heaven on earth the liturgy is supposed to be, isn't it? Yeah. With this kind of happy hooray for everything, optimistic sludge that 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 admonishes people, hey, there's no such thing as a good voice or a bad voice. It's like, there really is. And and you know it, and it sounds bad, and it's embarrassing for everyone. So I, I, I would make one clarification. I think a lot of people just don't know how to sing because they've never been raised in a musical tradition. So they're just, you know, it's kind of like you're in whitewater rafting and you're all rowing together. I mean, this person's kind of like slapping the water and messing it up. It's like, just don't row. Just it's not. Yeah. But if you can teach someone then they can sing. So I think probably 60% of people out there who are bad singers, they just need to be taught how to sing. Right. That's a big part of it. 
might have a big voice in there. Yeah. And then my, there's also like, there's a monastery I've been to and not all the men have operatic, wonderful voices, but there's something hauntingly beautiful of a few odd voices that, you know, you can tell they're not really trained. I mean, they're still hitting their pitches and their notes, but their voice is not, it's not what you would call an attractive voice, but there's something about, I think, I think there's something beautiful about that, hearing those voices blended, but you're right. If you don't know what you're doing, don't. Right. I mean, Johnny Cash, who has an amazing iconic voice, he wasn't a classic, um, you know, baritone, he would, you know, he wasn't classically trained, but he had a good, so yeah, we're not, we're not splitting hairs here. And the people out there listening to this podcast understand the singing is I, abysmal. I just bad. don't want people to cop out. Maybe you need to go try to learn how to sing instead of just saying, well, I'm, I'm not a singer. Right. I'm out. Right. Right. Maybe you if are. He, and, but, but if they cop out, well, well, maybe there's a slight parting of ways here. Maybe we're saying slightly different things, but at, at any rate, I'm saying mostly the same thing. If you want to sing, if you feel inclined to sing, then go get get some voice lessons. You can take even voice lessons at your local guitar center, um, or you can or you can probably ask one of the cantor or cantoresses at your parish to, hey, would you would you mind if I throw you twenty bucks a lesson? Would you give me and a few other people? She says, Yes, I will help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put their hand up. <laughs> yeah, I want to do what you do. Yeah. Um. Amen. Amen. I, I have another priest that does that in town. They think it's super cool. They'll like say some banal platitude and they'll go, Amen. Like, feel me, dog. Ja feel. And they want everyone to be like, bro, Amen. Which I hate. But uh, I hate most things. So so there's that. Yeah, just. just You're a real sing, liturgical curmudgeon, Timothy. I am. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an overarching curmudgeon. Notwithstanding the jokes, this is why we joke because uh, right. there's so much to be curmudgeonly about. I, you know, I am a real curmudgeon. That's that's fair. My wife, this is not a ninety percent thing. This is odd. Even the strength, you know, we're sort of at the eleventh hour in history. I like to imagine, even as late in the game as we are, as far into the degradation, this is rare. We are at a priest. Uh, we were at a little uh, parish in Utah, Southwest Utah doing a relative visit and the priest had like an earring. Right. And he had his golden retriever running around the mass and people were talking to my wife and I, who had a, a couple kids back then. I, I can't remember how long we'd been married. They're like, isn't that so cute? And we were both just like fuming. We were like, no, it's not cute. My wife ended up writing a piece called, uh, was that, was that altar dog properly trained that, that got a lot of laughs? I think she wrote it for Church Militant. It's, it's pretty I, funny. I, I don't under – priests who are super on their dogs concern me. So I'll just say that. Yeah. You don't they're even not, have to if say If they do the children thing, if you get the Christmas card and, like, they're both in a turtleneck, yeah. it's like Merry Christmas from Father and Fido. It's like, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> if you like that, I would be concerned. Right. No, no, him, him and Fido are each in like ugly Christmas sweaters, right. drink, drinking a With rum and it says, happy holidays from the Jesuits. And they're, and they're having a, a little man versus dog contest building right. gingerbread houses. <laughs> Not a good thing. It doesn't portend well. No, no. no. People are still mad at you, by the way. Oh, I think you man. know about the, I think, they I think that it. was an amazing tweet. I loved it. It's I loved epic. It. I, and I, and I'm, and I'm owning it and I love it. And I'm, I'm doubling down on it. Double down. I'm like triple the liberals. dog downing yeah. on it because yeah. it's ridiculous. And I, I just want to say for the record, I decorated with my children, gingerbread houses at Christmas. I did. Yeah. Do it every year, but I didn't but invite me. Right, not, right. I didn't call up Tim and all my buddies and be like, hey, man, my place, 7 p.m., BYOGB, bring your own gingerbread. We're going to have a right. decorating contest. Bring your best frosting. Bring your food coloring, your sprinkles. Let's do this. Let's, let's bring your natty light. This is what the yeah, bros do. This is what it? the bros do. No, I, I'm just saying that it's just, you know, that a seminary would – you know, seminarians would gather and a guy would wear a wig. There was a guy, the judge was wearing a wig. And if you looked at all the pictures on it um, and they were judging the gingerbread houses and yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, but I think it does. Uh, it, oh, he was it, really doing that. He really wore a wig. 
Yeah, there's that's a right. guy wearing a wig who the judge wore a wig. Like a, that like might a, not have been about judging, just yeah. saying. No, but, you don't like the whatever. wig that judges wear in, yeah, yeah. in England. Yeah, no, he was wearing it. a formal I'm... powdered wig. Um, you know, it's just not... I wouldn't think that adult men would want to gather to do such a thing. Outside of like 18th century England, the, the Whigs, who are a pretty <laughs> pretty cool political party, even though they hated Catholics. Right. They're pretty important for us. They were kind of cool and manly, but outside of that, wearing wigs isn't... In yeah. the current political climate of 2019, I mean, what if, that's what not if my some of your, your your buddies from church are like, "Hey Tim, this Saturday we can decorate gingerbread houses. I bought a powdered wig. I'm going to be the judge. I'm going to wear it. Tapping the keg. Yeah, wearing the wig. Yeah, judging, adjudicating some gingerbread. Just I saying, be there. It's going to be live, dog. So, but anyway, someone asked next Christmas, you and I do a gingerbread contest for charity. It might be kind of funny, especially if we had the kids in it. It, it would, if, but we're going to have to add, come up with some like SNL kinds of yes. digs at it. I'll, yeah. I'll do it, but if, if there's some, some Taylor Marshall uh, opprobrium thrown, some shade thrown yes. at, at Gingerbread, then, and then I, I, we I, can I, talk about that. Every other day I get comments on it. So People are like, you associate with Marshall, that Gingerbread hater? And I was like, oh, no, like I could have I denied proudly. the divinity of Christ. On Twitter, no one would care. I go after gingerbread decorating contests. It's not baking goods. Right. Those were kits, people. They didn't bake those. <laughs> they, didn't they didn't bake anything. Them. They went to Target or Sam's Club and they bought kits. And they right. had a contest. What, you're not into baking? I was like, well, I'm into eating my wife's baking. Good. And I, like you said, I helped Many saints decorate. were bakers. Well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, many Anywho. saints also weren't bakers. Anywho, and so yeah, this look we don't. So that's that's all that's all fine and good. We we capped off the hymns. They're ugly. They're bad. Go and make a difference by not singing at your church when they start singing. Go and make a difference. That's what I say. <laughs> Says I. That's the most ridiculous song I've ever heard. By the way, uh, we can what all I, agree. Well, go I was gonna say yeah. I mean, after they sing the hymn, you then you have to. Right. 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 I don't. It's painful. Yeah, it's painful. I'm, I'm, I have my applause is the next one. My daughter, my seven year old Maggie, um, I've trained her to go around. She, she just says loudly, like she's heard me do it for years. She says, clapping is bad, daddy. I said, <laughs> Clap, clapping is bad. We say it as loudly as we can. Right. The people clapping all around. Oh, this she's saying it good. in the liturgy. She's saying it like when people start yeah. clapping, we, we both look at each other and we furrow our brows. You need to get her a little, little cards printed up. She can kind of <laughs> pass them around. Yeah. yeah, Silence, please. Yeah, no, I mean, it's and, and literally old ladies who should be the shushers. I mean, old ladies are sort of the pre-designated yeah. preternatural shushers in, in any society. They're the ones clapping and they're, they're oh, looking at it. This happened on In 1954, uh, if you started clapping in mass, like five old ladies would start whipping you with rosaries, man. Exactly. You have like what, robery, what, rosary bruises on your face. That's right. And what, the, the old ladies in our society, in our Novus Ordo parishes, are asleep at the wheel. This is your, this is your hour, ladies. This is when you start slapping some face with some rosary. <laughs> Please, you shouldn't be the ones committing the applause. It, it's very bad. It's disgusting. Bene, there's a great Benedict quote on this. There Anytime is. Anytime applause breaks out during the liturgy, it... I forget how the rest of it goes, but, but Google, uh, he, he says, anytime it, it breaks out, it's Ratzinger as uh, director of the Holy Office, prefect for the CDF, saying in the, the dot, dot, dot is effectually something serious has gone awry with yeah. the prayer life. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, the earliest uh, that I know of, of, of a pause in the liturgy is St. Augustine. And it's, really? it's, it's not over music, it's over his sermons. He would applaud his sermons, but it pissed him off. What did he say? We well, didn't like That's it. He's like, shut up. Don't applaud. <laughs> shut up. Doesn't take <laughs> yeah. much to correct that. I don't Stop. know the exact Latin quotation that Augustine, but he, it was said that applause would sometimes break out in his sermons while he was mm -hmm. preaching, after he was preaching, something like that, and he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. It was like a four-letter abbreviation in, yeah. in Latin for mm -hmm. S S T. How does that go? Um, anyway, yeah, so I, I like that. That Saint Augustine, he probably would say it very brusquely. Yeah, uh, is shut, shut the heck up. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. Also, to, on the 
we're coming to the last couple points and I'm, I'm paranoid. I'm having, I'm having technical issues here today in the new year, but this kind of goes with the Eucharistic uh, abuses. So it, 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 it's high ranking again is when your priest, and again, this doesn't happen 90% of the time or better, but a lot of times it does. The priest encourages people not to kneel during the consecration. A lot of times this is by design where there will be a mass said in a gym or someplace utterly uh, unbefitting. So that, I mean, I don't know what the whole design is, but this way they also know they can be like, well, you're all sitting in bleachers, so you're not going to be able to kneel. Or they'll say just in general, like, hey, if you're in the hall watching this video, you know, because churches have spillover. The sometimes we're in the hall. Yeah, the simulcast. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you don't have to kneel on the marble floor. It's like, why not? This isn't that bad. It's just a way of um, instantiating the, if you read the, I've talked about it here before, the memoirs of communist agent AA 1025, one of the express goals of the communists infiltrating the seminaries was to quote, get these people up off their knees. Obviously, I think they mean right. during reception of the Eucharist, yeah. but they also mean don't, don't kneel before it when it's being consecrated and turned into right. ontologically what and it you know, is. The right way to do it is say, everyone kneels during the Eucharist. And if you're in pain or you have a bad knee, whatever, cool, stand up. Just move, move to the right. back, stand up. Right. You Fine. don't say, everybody don't kneel. You say, we're going to kneel. And if you have a problem, we don't judge you. Some people have a bad knee. Maybe you heard of playing right. basketball last night and it's really painful. Go stand in the back. It's fine. We're cool with that. But that doesn't mean that you undo the whole thing. Even that's the, oh, I mean, I'm fine with that, obviously. But even that falls in the category exceptions, which don't really need to be voiced, right? Kind of like. They don't like, need to be. Yeah. It's, yeah, like it's common you, sense. It's like telling your kids, hey, if you get the stomach flu and you need to puke, you can call out for us, but go vomit. It. Please stick your head in the toilet. It's, it's a million times more clean. You don't have to come up with the the uh, exception. Oh, and if you've just broken your femur, then you're not going to be able to do that. It's like, well, that rests right. the loquitur. That goes without well, saying. That's how so it is in the Latin keep, Mass. Everybody kneels. But when right. you get into long services like Good Friday and whatnot, I'm telling you, that's it's pretty hard, especially if you're a 60-year-old man, you know, or 70, right. 80. And Father doesn't make any announcements. It's just common sense. Everybody kneels. It's obvious. Everybody yeah. kneels. And if you need a breather, take a breather. Or if you're saying mass in the leper colony and no one's got legs, <laughs> then they're, they're not going to be able to kneel. I mean, you don't have to say that. It's just common sense. Right. Like, but everyone knows what it means and, and everyone knows what they're doing by exaggerating the exception, right. by height, heightening the natural occurrence of the said exemption. Right. It's a bunch of bull roar. And just all the, the, those like little instructions like, uh, for example, you may all be seated now. Well, right. we've all been going to mass for 20 years. We know when after the creed we sit down, whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Those kind of things. I, I, I notice that deacons like to do that a lot. They like to boss people around. Right. It's kind of like when you, uh, people will be getting mad at this. As, as a card-carrying hypochondriac, I'm always nervous going into a doctor. Who I will not see are the nurse practitioners, new doctors. What are the other ones? The physician's <laughs> assistant. They are the ones that create hypochondria and propagate hypochondria because they'll be like, oh, a little cough, that could be a cold, or that could be HIV. And you're like, well, I know. The <laughs> right. good, the, well, I mean, they're the ones throwing at you. Technically, there's a yes. one in a million. It could be this. And it's like, you don't have to say that. It falls in right. the recipes of luck order thing. Right. You don't, yes, if I don't have legs, I can't kneel. I don't need you to tell me this. Anatomically right. speaking, it presents itself. So if you have a cough, you know, if you hear hooves, as good doctors say, Think horses, not zebras. Uh, that's that's right. we need we need horse thinking uh, right. priests, not not in some weird way, uh, but we need horse thinking priests when they hear hooves. Don't take me out of context here, people. Yeah, and then the final thing is, uh, I, and I'll, I'll let you talk on this because I know it's one of your your big things. It's one of my big things too, but you might have some more substance. Girl altar boys, as my Latin priest friend calls them my, my favorite term for them girl altar boys altar boys who are actually girls not a fan <laughs> just not a fan of them at all and the reason is is they are serving 
at the altar to be exposed to the priesthood. In the Catholic Church, there's a priest, and then there are deacons, and then traditionally there are subdeacons, acolytes, uh, exorcists, lectors, and porters, all these orders, right? And they serve the priest. They're clerical servants to the priest. Now, unfortunately, you know, Vatican II got rid of all the minor orders. Uh, we do have deacons around in general, but subdeacons, ordained acolytes, lectors, those are usually kind of in the seminaries. So we have altar boys who sort of fill in as proxies, and they're young men, so they're seen as more pure and not as worldly, and so they help the priest. But a priest doesn't need a 12-year-old to move a book. He can move a book. Right. Right? It's not like, how am I going to get this book to move if I only had a 12-year-old around here? <laughs> you know, or who's going to move these two cruets four feet? Yeah. He, he can. I mean, when a priest is by himself or in a leper colony, he can serve the whole thing if he wants. Right. Technically speaking, but it does yeah, add dignity speaking. to the mass to have servants to the priest. It, 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 there's, there's a beauty to it. There's an order. It does assist the priest, right. And frees his, his appendages and his mind to do his right. prayers and to do what he's supposed to do and offering the sacrifice. So all that's good. But the reason primarily that we have young men up there, there's a functional one that is to move the cruets around and the book and all that, but it's to expose them to the priestly life. It right. is your farm team. It is right. your recruitment. And right. as soon as you bring one girl onto the team, it ceases to be a recruitment pool. I like it. Well, I like that. I don't like the, the girl yeah. on the team. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not against girls, right? The, the Blessed Virgin Mary is higher than Peter and Paul and John and all that. Mary Magdalene's a super saint. You know, we have saints who are non-gendered, angels, right? They don't, they're not male or female. They have no genitalia. So that's not, what we're, we're not talking about sanctity here. We're talking about the function of the two sexes that God created, male and female. Crude functionalism. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And God had a choice to make. I can be, the, the logos can become incarnate as a male body or as a female body. It's a choice. He chose male. Now, there's all sorts of ontological reasons for that, but he chose male. He was circumcised. He was a Jewish male. And because of that, whenever a priest stands at the altar and says, this is my body, the body he's referring to is a male body. Ergo, priests have to be male. That's the argument. It's That's an ontological, it. yeah. metaphysical argument based on Christ nature. Christological. And, yeah. yeah, based on nature and creation. And the choice yeah. God made in becoming incarnate. And by the way, he's consubstantial with men and women because male and female is not, there's not two different species. There's only one human species that comes right. in male and female. We get that from Genesis 1, 2. So you put girls in there and you're like, well, we, why don't we have any priests? What's our vocations? Well, you kind of messed up the machine. Right. Yeah, for sure. It's like, you know, you, you had a minor league to recruit for your major league, and then you also kind of threw in some softball pitchers in there, too, from the girls. It's like, well, how come we don't have any good pitchers coming up through the ranks anymore? Well, you kind of messed up your farm team. People don't want to play anymore, right? We, yeah. we, like, we like NBA. If they, people don't like WNBA, which is why it's been, in the, it's been in the red 21 seasons out of 21. It's a draw on the NBA. If they mix the W.O. in the NBA, you probably have guys that don't even want to be basketball players anymore. Sorry. Like, that's just that's just how nature's wild. Well, I, I, men have stronger bodies. And in general, people are say, oh, I know this one woman. She can deadlift 700 pounds. I understand. Right. But in general, that's just, you know, how it is. And On we have note, roles. Though, exceptionally, though, they're, they're OK. A freakishly strong woman. Just because this is this always lurks behind everything we say, the the sex stuff, right? Uh, the two sexes. What happens to a woman's reproductivity when she gets super strong? It like even away. like a gymnast, it goes away. It, it goes away. It, it, so ontologically, nature is still whispering at us. And it's actually not whispering; it's more like yelling. If a woman gets super strong because she stop menstruating, she stops menstruating. She and, stops, you, and she even can't the have poor girls later. who are the 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 fantastic. I like watching the female gymnasts in the Olympics. It's like wow, it's amazing. But they lose their menstrual cycle. It's a fact. Whereas whereas with a man, when he gets strong, the male gymnasts yeah. are like super virile. 
Right. Uh, I, I was talking about this with uh, Matt Marsden, the Catholic actor, and it's like, yeah, like, I mean, I'm not trying to be gross or TMI, but guys get super virile when they're doing even even exercise to exercise lifting weights are super good for the uh, testosterone count, which is a quantifiable yeah. thing. Like yeah. like squats are yeah, working really out good. raises a testosterone. It's just a, f- a scientific fact. It's science. Yeah. So. So, yeah, that's always behind there. And it's like we, we just want to say, yeah, there, there is still objective nature squinting at us when, you know, not not right. you and I, but when society's going off the rails with the gender binary um, attack right. that it's making. Right. And, and, it, it, and it holds for for girl altar boys and as let, well. And let's which, be honest, most people who who engineered the idea of altar girls and promote it and cheer for it and all that. They secretly want women priests. Of course. Oh, of course. I think that I, I, I could give me, give me, give me seven minutes on Google and I'll find yes. you a, a quote from a high ranker oh, yeah. saying that this is the point that yes. ultimately is to get them into quote ministry. Right. It's gradual. Yeah, give me three minutes on Google. It's so, gradual. Yeah, first we'll get altar girls. Then we'll get altar uh, girl lectors and acolytes. And then we'll have girl deacons, female deacons. Then we'll have female priests and then we'll have a female pope. Right. That's the game. Right. Right. But I got nothing to add to that. Yeah. So it has to do with the stamp that God placed on creation and all the mammals, whether it's male and female. And the especially in mammals, the very important role of the mother in the life of the offspring. It's very yeah. important. Yep. That's why we hyperduliate only one creature in the universe, the mother of Jesus Christ. She gets right. highest veneration, highest praise because of that reality. So, all right. Well, are there any more? You got any more? I Abuses? mean, I'll think of five after we finish. Exactly. But yeah, or well, maybe we can, everybody in the live I chat, go down into the comments and uh, I'm sure we missed some. But I'm going to close with saying that, you know, I'm not, Obviously, I don't reject the Novus Ordo. I don't think it's invalid. Um, but I do see, as having attended the Latin Mass now for about 10 years, it's coming up on, I think this May will be 10 years, uh, that I've grown closer to Jesus, our Lord, in the older liturgy. There's a quiet, there's a reverence that I cannot even get close to in the Novus Ordo. And I think just for that reason, I mean, just we could go through all the the liturgical practicalities, but at the end of the day, I'm just going to give my own personal witness, and that is, is better. And I don't have to be worried about everything that Tim just laid out in the last hour. It's not even there. You know, no. I, get, I can get so caught up in prayer with with our Lord, and then I hear the bell ring, and it like snaps me out. Like, oh, here comes the consecration. I love it. It's perfect. Right. That that never happens in the other in the other liturgies. So, I made a challenge in Advent, and that was to attend a Latin Mass at least once. Try it all four Sundays, and a lot of people did that. That's great. Um, I would challenge people maybe as we get into Lent to to do the other, to do that same thing. Find a Latin Mass, go attend, check it out. The first time you go, you're going to be so confused. Just don't even try to understand. Just take it in. And pray. And you'll, pray. you'll be invited to pray yeah. by, by the, the form of the Mass. Yeah. It's just better. It's like, it's like a side-by-side comparison of New Coke and Old Coke. Or something even right. more stark. They they would never do that. They would never. I, I think this is why they hated Samorum Pontificum is because anyone that sees like this is just clearly better. I mean, it's like right. setting having Michael Jordan playing, you know, a high school basketball player one on one. There is no reasonable disagreement here. It's it's just clearly way better at what liturgy is meant to do. There's no question. Yes. I, I, but come on. Even if you take the best Novus Ordo out there, the very right. best, it's ad orientum, it's communion rail, it's communion on the tongue, it's uh, chanted, it's polyphony, it's every gorgeous architecture, everything, and you put it up against the best of the old rite, 
the old right wins. Right. Yeah. No question. And especially if you get into something like feast days or you get into, say, the old Palm Sunday versus the new Palm Sunday, or the old Good Friday versus the new Good Friday, the old vigil, man, that's when it really the that's when things spread out a lot. It's not close. Yeah. It's it's not close anyway. But mm-hmm. just for the record, last note from me, I, I would take the superlative, this hypothetical superlative Novus Ordo Mass over what I'm going to most weeks. You know, I can travel 45 minutes for the Latin Mass, which right. I do occasionally. But I would take that. But it never. it's I don't know where there is one. That's what it's, about the best? They always throw this at you. What about the best where none of these abuses exist? I've people never heard experience. Of it is it's easier to just find a local Latin mass than it is to go and find the unicorn Novus Ordo. It is a unicorn. It is the, you're talking to a dude. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that's, that's the unicorn. It doesn't it's exist. the unicorn. No, they, Send it I in. think there's some, you, there's some that exist. There's some that exist. They have none of these? You're, you're a legend. Okay, someone out there that, 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 has, that has been to a Novus Ordo I'm not. I'm not weighing in one way or the other. I'm open minded mm-hmm. as always. That's, yeah, I've been to it. I've been to it. I've been, been to it. it. Yeah, I've been. Okay, to it. I believe you. Yeah. I believe you. But you, what you want to do is throw a cage around that thing. That's a unicorn. That's Send a unicorn. It in so we can research it. That's right. Actually, that, let, commenters, people out there, let us know if you've been to the unicorn. We want to know where the unicorns are. I think people would want to know where the unicorns are. It's valuable because yeah. it's a lot, a lot. That's still not a Latin mass. Right. A TLM. But uh, I I would I would settle for that and yeah. uh, be be very happy compared to what I'm settling for. Yeah. Uh, and I think 20 years from now, when we do the TNT 20 year anniversary of this episode, we're going to be talking about how wow, who would have thought that the Latin Mass would have surpassed the old Novus Ordo? Because I'm telling you, it's growing so fast. It is, and the and the the main demographic because I've been studying this is priests. Is it the 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 young men are wanting to go into the older orders and you know like FSSP Institute of Christ the King? Everyone always asks us about SSPX. This is not the time, but SSPX just announced that they had their biggest incoming seminary class since their founding in 1970. Wow, that's great! They're exploding. I mean, They're exploding. I mean, yeah. if you're a young man and you're like, do you want to be a priest in the Grover? situation or do you want to be a priest over here it's obvious right i don't see right i don't see why you would choose the former a young man that loves the faith that's not been commissioned yeah. by to, to sunk right. gallen to uh, help right. destroy or who knows about it i think a lot of guys now going through the system don't even really know about it but those that know about it and they can start from fresh seminary day one where would you rather be it's kind of obvious to me but Yes, sir. So there it is. All right. Well, Tim, thanks for thanks for your thoughts today, and uh, everybody pray the rosary. Go to mass. Go make a difference. Go make a difference. (laughs) We are go become church. Make yeah, become church. Yeah, become church. So all right, get the white man's overbite going. Do your little sway (laughs) thing. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's all bad. It's all ugly. All that. All right, everybody, like and subscribe. God bless. Bye. Bye bye.